everybody. This is criminal defense attorney Melissa Lefkowitz. And this is relationship and trauma recovery coach Dorit Reichenthal. And you're listening to Call for Justice right here on KABC. Now, in recognition of Family Court Awareness Month, tonight we'll be discussing two forms of abuse that sadly intersect and are all too common in our family court system, child abuse and domestic violence. With us in studio this evening are the brilliant and extraordinary Dr. Payam Cade of MindQuest Counseling and attorney Sharon Gatan of California Legal Counsel. Welcome to Call for Justice. Now, before we call for justice around these two forms of abuse, let's first define them. Sharon, you've handled thousands of domestic violence restraining orders. Tell us, how is domestic violence defined under the law? So, thank you so much for having me, Melissa and Doreen. Oh, we it's are so excited to have you, Sharon. Thank you so much. So, domestic violence, there's actually two subcategories. There's domestic violence, the actual penal code 273.5, and then there's domestic violence, which are the restraining orders. Two separate yet related. Now, in a classic domestic violence arrest, there is an automatic protective order, which is issued to the victim upon the arrest of the defendant. So, that's good. You're set. That's taken care of. However, sadly, in the state of affairs that we have today, with not as many arrests because of our um, looser policies, shall we say, people actually have to go forward with their own restraining orders. Now, when does that happen? We have to prove for domestic violence that the defendant willfully inflicted corporal injury on a victim. Willfully? Willfully. Was no willfully accident. Willfully inflicted corporal injury. Yeah. That's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. The injury has to be with somebody that they had a relationship with. So that could be boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife. This doesn't pertain to like your neighbor, Bob. Right. So you guys, you have to have had a relationship with this person. So you either cohabitated, you dated them, right? Exactly right. Whether it's so, it doesn't dating, protect children. Just to be clear, it, it doesn't. This pertains to the partner v partner, and again, whether it be current partner or ex partner, still under the same umbrella. Mm-hmm. Now, you what might about ask, new? What about uh, like uh, a new paramour, a new a dating, absolutely. a new a absolutely, new, okay. absolutely, anybody in that relationship status, whether it be previous or current, falls under the umbrella. Okay, just now, not kids. Just not kids, sadly. Just not kids. Okay. Now, people might ask, what is corporal injury? Corporal injury could be hitting, punching, kicking, slapping, pushing, or biting. What about yeah. like stalking? Um, no, that's going to be a different char- charge, and that's going to be stalking. Okay. Yeah. No, domestic violence, there has to be a physical, some sort of a physical contact between the two partners. What about... But in the, under the Domestic Violence Prevention Act here in California, doesn't disturbing the calm, disturbing the peace of one person to another, um, is that not justification for a DVRO, a domestic violence restraining order? No, it depends if we can show a pattern. Uh-huh. I've had clients where there has been revenge porn. That's very common, where uh, they have an ex-partner who has you know naked photos of them who threatens to post or even does post on different social media sites. I have, I would say, at least half a dozen of that variety in my um, office right now. And judges really, really frown upon that. Yeah. So that would. Okay. Now, you say, what, what, other kind of, what other, other kind of ideas did you have? What that? about like a pattern of emotional abuse or coercive conduct? Um, depends. It has to be, it has to be, such that it is truly interfering with the life of this other individual for the judge to grant the order. Interesting. Yeah. 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 Give me a hypothetical, though, and I can tell you in my experience what I think would happen. Now, moving on from corporal injury, we want to understand what is willful infliction? Intentional, deliberate, definitely not accidental. Most important thing, let's say a husband wants to just push a wife just to kind of, you know, make his point, be real physical, yet she's standing at the top of the stairs. He pushes her thinking she'll just, you know, lose her balance and maybe trip, but she doesn't trip. She falls all the way down to the bottom of the stairs. Doesn't matter. You're on the hook. Right. The consequences don't matter whether she would have tripped. That's reasonably foreseeable. Right? Definitely. Sure. I mean, you've got to know that that could happen. 
Definitely. Now, most important, what happens when there is some sort of an altercation between husband and wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, and they have a child? Whether A, the child is in the room awake, B, the child is in the room asleep, C, the child is in another room awake, or D, the child is in another room asleep. All of these are different, you know, categories. If the child is in the room, really, if the child is in the house, <clears throat> short of them being an infant that's dead asleep, and even in those cases I've seen, DCFS comes knocking. And let me tell you guys Good. what I tell my clients, yeah, as should. they should. Good. Right? Absolutely. DCFS is far more frightening than any criminal court, and it's a good thing. Because DCFS is is the only recourse any of these kids have. Right. Absolutely. So an investigation starts. As soon as there's a domestic violence case with a child present in the home, DCFS comes in. As a, as a couples therapist and as a therapist, quite often I have seen the personality disordered parent when they know there's going to be a breakup in the marriage, initiate a call to protective service and claim child abuse against the other spouse and will get the case going um, as a divorce tactic. It's it's not even that novel of an idea. It happens far more frequently uh, than it should. And I hate to say this, but it sometimes seems whoever calls or whoever pulls the trigger first seems to have the leg up, if right. you will. That's As disgusting. Exactly. Right. Yeah, I've recently though. seen a case where mom, who was the protective mom, lost custody. The This was not in the state of California. This was um, in um, Northwest. And in that particular case, um, the DCFS workers were afraid of the... Well, it was the father in this case that initiated the call. And he got sole custody of the kids. And the three boys were very, very afraid of this wow. person. Wow, that's an injustice. Wow. Yeah. That's just such a grave injustice to listen to. Let's talk about child abuse, okay? Because it's very different. And it shouldn't be. There's a lot of similarities, okay? And you know, the way I see it, domestic violence in the presence of a minor child is child abuse. Yeah. Unfortunately, the courts don't always see it that way because it's not always defined the same way, right? It, it depends on what happened. So, Dr. Payam Cade, can you tell us what is child abuse? What rises to the level of child abuse for the law? for DCSF, for the government, for the state, you know, for, for ethical standards, for morality. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you for actually, thank you for inviting me to the show. Uh, when DCFS in California gets involved currently, not in the past, currently, we use a couple of tools. One of the tools that they use to assess is called a safety assessment tool, which was created originally uh, by a non-profit organization. It's being used in California, a lot of other states in Australia, in Japan, a lot of other countries. There is also a risk assessment tool and I happen to be the um, expert for Department of uh, Children and Family Services in Los Angeles County on these tools. Wow. So I have been training it, teaching it, working with people on it and it's, a, it's not a very difficult tool to use. It is not a very easy one if you're not experienced. The, the way we define child abuse, it has to meet the Welfare Institution Code Subdivision 300. So when a social worker is dispatched, they go out to either immediately or within five days to investigate a case. Um, what they do is they use the safety assessment tool to see if there is an imminent risk to the safety of the child. And that is for physical abuse, neglect, sexual abuse, um, probably f a bad physical condition of the home, unwillingness of a parent to protect the child, that could be also under domestic violence. So if a child is involved in domestic violence, and for example, let's say the father is the perpetrator, but the mother is unwilling to protect the child, you, DCFS can actually file on the mother too. 
not just under on the failure father. to act. Exactly, mm -hmm. failure right? To failure act. to protect. Yes, that's, that's right. We, we, we charge the mother with neglect because she has failed to protect the child in a case of a domestic violence, especially if the child has been injured. So domestic violence is a very big issue, and of course, we look into their mental health situation with the same tool, developmental cognitive impairment of the parents and the children. And this is how safety tool is used so that a social worker can then contact the supervisor to see what's the next step to take. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, I, I have some questions, but I believe we're coming up on a commercial. We're coming up on our first commercial, but this is so fascinating <laughs> and I have a hundred questions. Okay, fine. We'll wait. First commercial break, everybody, stay tuned. You're listening to Call for Justice right here on 790 KABC. Justice, this is criminal defense attorney Melissa Lefkowitz. And relationship and trauma recovery coach Dorit Reichenthal. And with us in studio this evening are the extraordinary Dr. Payam Cade and attorney Sharon Gatan with us tonight. Now, right before the studio break, we were listening to Dr. Payam Cade tell us about DCSF and specifically a safety assessment tool that he was behind. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. The tool that I was talking about is pretty simple. There's, there's obviously different type of tools that this is being used, but Originally, when the call comes in and a social worker is dispatched to the location, obviously some are trained, very well trained, some are not. So they actually apply the tool and then contact the supervisor to see what's the next step. If the tool determines that there is a safety issue at the moment, at, in the, inside the house, there's two options. One is they take the child into, into custody and that's with exigency, of course. So there is really no need to get a warrant. We can just remove the child. Let's say, for example, the child says, my father said, when I get home, I will kill you and I will shoot you with a gun. <gasps> so then we do have the right to take the child into custody if we believe that threat is actually imminent and it can happen. We don't have time to go get a warrant. So we take the child into custody. Of course, that should be ordered only by a supervisor. A social worker does not have the right to take the child without discussing the case with the supervisor. If the, child, if the threat is not imminent and we think that there is a possibility that we can, let's say it's a domestic violence situation. Father and the mother had a fight last night. <clears throat> the child was not injured, but the child, we actually see the trauma on the child, right? So we can actually make a safety plan at that time with the family. Both parents will sign and of course they can rescind it at any time and say we're not going to participate in the safety plan at any time. If one of the parents leaves the home, that safety plan in LA County right now is good for seven days. So let's say the father says, okay, fine, I'm gonna go stay with my mother. The child can stay home with the mother. And I'm gonna go stay with my own mother, which meaning the paternal grandmother of the child. That's when the safety plan is signed and the child is left home with the mother until we continue the investigation and find out what's the next step that we're gonna take. Or are we gonna take this before the court, meaning juvenile court, um, dependency court, or we're just gonna close it or maybe provide some service to the family and then close it or make a voluntary case with the family. There are all lots of different possibilities. If it's a voluntary case, obviously, meaning the parents would agree to work with the department so we don't file anything in the, in the courts. We just deal with the family ourselves, and we provide services so we can maybe hopefully make, the, make this whole situation better. If the family does not wanna work with us or we think that they're not going to cooperate or work with us, then we file a petition in court that petition could be non-detained, meaning we're not going to take the child into custody. We just file a non-detained petition and let the judge look into our case. Or we file, we get a warrant and we remove the child with a warrant. Um, in majority of the cases at the moment, unfortunately, we get a warrant to remove if the child is um, being faced with a safety situation. When there is no safety. That means, let's say we go out and there is really not a physical abuse. The child has not been seriously injured, just minor stuff. Or um, there is a possibility that maybe the living condition can become better, for example. But right now, it's not in a good situation. We continue the investigation, but we use another tool calling the risk assessment tool. Risk assessment tool means what is likely going to happen in the next few months if we leave this family alone. That tool will tell us how much risk are they involved in. Wow. 
And so with, the, with that, we look at the, if they have a prior investigation with us, if they have, have, if they have uh, alcohol or drug abuse situation going on, or they've had it in the past. Did they have allegations with the department before that they were investigated by us or law enforcement? We check their background uh, to see if they have a background check of an, <coughs> any type of arrest. We check basically to see if there has been non-accidental injuries in the past, if they have maybe killed a child in the past. And I know everybody's gonna not gonna believe that, but that happens. Um, so we also look at the current allegations. How serious are they? So this tool is ranked between low, moderate to high, and very high for rankings. If it's a very high and high, most likely we open a case and we either voluntarily or in court and work with them. So that tool also, but that tool is not just the tool itself. It's a discussion between the social worker, the supervisor and all of that stuff. In that tool, before it gets completed, we call collaterals, family members, law enforcement, all kinds of stuff, school, we check with their doctor. We go through a whole- I love everything you do. We get before we get look at all home. the services that DCSF offers. This is not offered in family court. It's only <laughs> offered in dependency court. DCFS has but, a bad rap. In the past, we've been uh, called baby snatchers. I have actually oh, been wow. accused of making money every time I take a child into custody. We don't send. We don't make a cent. I tell you right now. Otherwise, I would be a multimillionaire. But it's the so opposite. The it's the opposite. You guys are offering these incredible services to these families that they would never get in family court. And never, we never get it in mostly, family court yeah, because the only free. time DCFS is triggered is if there's some sort of a criminal action, right? Or else, why would DCFS be triggered? People who go into family law might just be too you know, uh, a set of parents who don't get along, but there's absolutely nothing criminal happening. Absolutely. So they're never going to get guided. DCFS, something really bad went down. They, so they're intervening they in order for things to don't yeah, get worse. Yes, for us to get involved, they, it has to fall within the Welfare Institute Code uh, Subdivision 300, A to J. If it doesn't fall into that, we don't get involved. It right, A to, through J being physical be. abuse, neglect, sexual, sexual abuse, abuse being J, yes. you know, everything yes. from, you know, physical to sexual abuse, emotional, the whole nine neglect, yards. Like if you don't feed the child or any other type of neglect. Right. Like you haven't taken the child to the doctor for three and a half years and right. having some kind of an issue. Um, if, for example, people don't believe it, but in some cases where blood transfusion, for example, is required. The parents um, refuse because of their religion. They don't want to do it. DCFS at that time takes the child into custody and takes care of the blood transfusion. Wow. With the court order, and, of course. And, yeah, and that, we see that happen oftentimes when a child is diagnosed with cancer or yes. some kind of they have know, a leukemia. Lot of yeah. I, I have a quick question. Going back to the first segment, you talked about if the mother can't, so if you have an abusive father, a physically abusive father, there's domestic violence and the mother cannot protect herself or their child. You said the child will be removed? Yes. Is that often the What yes. about like, you know, keeping the mother and child together, but providing services for that parent as opposed to? Most, like you said, most often I have to tell you that it does take shape that way. Okay. We do release the child to the mother. Okay. And then we ask them to go into a shelter, maybe go to a family member, stay away from the alleged perpetrator and get some services. And we but do provide those services. But they have to want the services. They have to accept the services. Yes. You, you, you can lead the horse to water, but you can't force them to drink. But so, so here's where the attorneys come in too. Sure. So when we have a domestic violence case and the family comes to us, we let them know now, usually, I don't want to say all, but usually we represent obviously one or the other. Right. But what we try to do, for instance, is we try to help the family. Sure. So we will tell the other spouse, listen, we want you to stay with the child and protect the child and we're going to remove this person. So we will tell the client, you need to move. Right. You need to move. You go live with, you know, your mom, you live with your dad, your brother, Go live in a hotel. I don't care. And if they cooperate, because sometimes we tell them, but then two days later, we find them with the perpetrator. No. So and that's when they, re they lose the child themselves. We exactly. The child no, as, from the parents. as far as the attorney's advice, we never do that. Right. We tell them stay away and we tell them that DCFS will right, come Right, but then, you. you know, I mean, the reality is, right, there's an actual syndrome. And I'm going to sure. call to Dorit to speak to this. 
that this is an actual affliction. There are women out there who who go back to their batterers. So, so, so the again, the reality is most often it can take up to 11 times before <gasps> that is true before mm-hmm. a woman will be able to leave her batterer and 11 we, times 11 times now look we all That's have wild. to understand hold on we have to understand that the time that a mother or a woman is at greatest risk is when she leaves the relationship and she knows. Oh, just, it's the most dangerous time ever. Exactly. Ever. And there is a reason why. she's She most often isn't going back because she loves and she misses her perpetrator. She goes back because she knows she is at risk. He's found her. Um, financial. She's financially strapped. She has no way to you know, feed her child. The services are And they are don't have diminishing. too much support. Absolutely. And they don't have too much support. Exactly. Oftentimes no they don't go back support. when there is a lot of social support around them. Absolutely. And they get a lot of protection from DCFS, the police, the family members, everybody around them understands them and takes care of them. There is a greater chance of them going back when, as you said perfectly, um, they don't find that support or they feel vulnerable. Like if I go on my own, I may not be able to make it. I have to go back. Right. And I'm afraid. If I, if I go on my own, he may find me, he may kill me, he may t- take my child away, he may do this and do that. So they go back. Absolutely. And so we have to understand as the professionals that this is the time the woman is at greatest risk. And unless we can help her with a safety plan where she truly is protected. Um, and I've had cases where the woman has been killed. Right. And it's really serious. This is good because DCFS also gets them a restraining order, serves the other party, does all of that for them. So they don't have to do anything. We take care of everything for them. That's amazing. When we get that makes in. it so much easier. It and makes it easier because we step in and we ask the judge to do it and then we'll serve the other parent. And keeping in mind that even though there's a restraining order, if you're dealing with a personality disordered person... <laughs> That restraining order is not going to be a deterrent. Not if he has it in his head that they're going to to do bodily harm. Absolutely, I had That's a right. client. I had a client recently in one of the Valley Courts, where um, interestingly enough, he was a professional as well and really should have known better. Frankly, he had the hundred yard distance. He would literally measure to one hundred and one, yeah, and sit outside and watch the house. Whoa. Yep. And then he would keep coming back <laughs> and back and back. That's how, how many times can we save you? That's wild. And, and how many courts, times? All right. The, with, with that, still, we have to take yeah, a quick we'll commercial back. break. But when we get back, we will hear more from our fabulous experts. You're listening to Call for Justice right here on 790 KABC. You're listening to Melissa Lefkowitz, criminal defense attorney. And relationship and trauma recovery coach, Dorit Reichenthal. And with us tonight are two almost regulars, rock stars. Sharon Gatan. And Dr. Payam Cade. Now, they are with us tonight. We are talking about Family Court Awareness Month. But we want to make a quick segue because, like I just said, they are regulars with us. And the last time that we were here... We spoke about what was happening in Iran, and it's a terrible injustice what's happening there. So what I want to know is, do we have an update tonight? And I know that we do because we were talking about it at commercial break, so let's be real. Right. Okay? Right. So let's let's give our update out, and let's inform the public about what's going on, what just happened, and I'll keyword you guys with the word 15,000. So thank you so much for continuing to shed light on this, um, Melissa and Dorit. I think it's so important for us to continue to talk about it because the truth is, I believe, based on what I'm reading and what I'm hearing, that the uh, government in Iran right now is pretty much waiting for everyone to get bored. We are now over, what is it, 48, 49 days now? Well, 50 days. I 50 days. They are thinking that we are going to lose interest in this cause. It's unreal. And uh, I, they have 15,000... Um, 15,000 protesters in their jail right now. 
And these are people who have not gone before any judge, any jury, any attorney you asked, and we were laughing about so, it. So I actually asked Sharon, I said, so where are the attorneys? There are no attorneys. Like, what's happening? Where are these people's lawyers? And Sharon's response was, there are no attorneys. That's, and and that, a joke. that horrifies me because it's, I can't imagine living in a world where I can't help people and where people aren't getting the help that they need. That is shocking to me. Well, and that's because they don't have court systems um, where it's about justice. You know, it's the, about money. There right. is, there is it's no, about money. The government power itself has no justice. Control. That's it. That's the, it. The government itself has no justice. Doesn't stand on justice right. at all. It That's not, not what they're not, about at all. There is no equality. There is no justice. There is no voice. There is no choice. You have no rights, but the rights that we tell you that you have. So the, some most of these protesters have never broken the law before. Almost ever. all of them never ever before. There's no the, history. Their only There's, crime is that criminal. they're it's, asking it's, for freedom. That's it. That's their crime. They're if you protest once, you go into the you go into the prison. So the irony is, the people that are in the prison right now are not people like, again, right. classically determine and define as criminals. They don't have rap these, sheets. Not at no, all. And these are kids. journalists, the, and they're also these children. are young kids. kids. These are students, teenagers, so, so, teenagers. Supposedly. Anyone who's done anything since the whole Masa Amini has, thing has started sure. is in there. And they have vowed to execute. Yes, you heard Who's me. Who's doing this? Execute. I don't understand. The, supposedly 220 the, members of the parliament, 270 members, they have 270 members, 220 have asked or have requested that they be executed. Executed. The Do you parliament understand? Being a kid, for for being a kid. And, to set and an example. So a mass execution of yes. 15,000 people. Yes. Yes. A mass genocide. Yes. That's what this is. Right. Yes, it exactly. Is. And we have to call for justice. Yes. And, and that's what I right. don't understand is why people from that government are still allowed to come to New York for crying out loud. They come to New York, they to get anywhere. VIP treatment, their daughters are they here, their Canada. sons are here, they're on yachts and wearing bikinis. Yet these people over That's there. That's outrageous. For, absolutely. Right. They wear the hijab not properly. Oh, their kids don't wear the hijab. Of course. These yeah, mullahs, they don't. have Instagram posts looking like, you know, influencers. Are right. you kidding me? Really? Yeah, yes. they're going head to head with they Kim Kardashian. Wear. Are you joking? Yes. This is crazy. It's very sad. sad wow. It's completely, it's completely it's, two standards. It's sad. It's criminal. Immoral. It's unjust, Immoral. but it's criminal. Well, what can be done? What's the solution to this? Is there no solution? We're just going to sit idly by? The only solution I hear, and I'd love to hear from Dr. Kate, is just simply just keep posting, keep talking about it, keep making sure. Because but to what people, end? What are people doing? Yes. They're, they're throwing Molotov just cocktails at the molas. And the then homes. more deaths and more, you know, and that's it? So look, this is happening from within. I mean, it's... You know, there is so much protest and they, like you said, I think they thought they would get tired and bored, but it's not happening this time. And I think they're Because it's a revolution this time. It's not a protest. Right. I think exactly. the, the people have had it. Yeah. But why aren't we taking to the streets? I mean, there's a mass genocide going on. Why aren't we physically taking to the streets? Beverly Hills had um, Beverly Hills, the mayor of Beverly Hills, <laughs> Lily Bossy, and a couple of uh, there's a couple Persian um Influential folks on the board. They actually organized an event. It was just last week. I don't last know if you heard about it. One in Orange County on Sunday. In Orange County as well. Yes, they they literally to. shut down Rodeo and Little Santa Monica and they shut down yes. the streets and had people walking and walking and walking. Wilshire Boulevard in front of the, uh, uh, the Four Seasons over there and uh, Beverly Wilshire Hotel. So, yeah. I mean, I don't know what else can be done. I really don't know. It's I ask this question every day. And then you told me something very shocking. There's this whole anthem of this young man named Shervin who wrote this song, Baraya, which is going to be, uh, I believe, Oscar nominated now. Yes. And Dr. And King, I heard what's that happening he, to, to this I, famous singer? I heard that he was uh, jailed and then released. No. Yes. And they have, uh, they have supposedly, that's what I'm hearing, that they're calling for his execution. No, for a it. song. For a song. No, do you what understand? To that athlete who didn't wear the hijab. No one's heard from her since. They took her and her brother. Remember? No. Yeah. So they're all in the they're all in the prison. By right. the way, they're all in the so prison. So the fifteen k, they'd be part of it. The fifteen thousand people. Yeah, and some of them are actually kids. They, they are kids. They're, they're, Absolutely, oh my God, they are these kids. These are children. Yeah. yeah. 
We're talking about child abuse that this weaves in perfectly. This weaves in perfectly. They, there's, there's no, there are no chi- children's rights over there. There is no rights. No. Well, and talking about children's rights, if we could segue to this Thursday, um, there's going to be a demonstration at the Stanley Mosque Court from 8.30 a.m. to wow. 11.30 a.m. Wow. For the release, we talked about this last week, Maya and Sebastian, who were forcibly removed from their home. The videos are horrific. Um, you could see it online on One Mom's Battle, um, their website. Um, and it Just go to Instagram to One Mom's Battle or just go to Twitter and do hashtag justice for Maya and Sebastian and it'll come up. You have to see this video. It's mind blowing. It will really throw you. I mean, because just if it happened to Maya and Sebastian, it could happen to anybody. We need to be vigilant about children's rights and institutional child abuse is no is no better. I mean, we're here talking about child abuse, and what we see on this video is court order child abuse. We've all seen this video. Unbelievable. I think it's great that it's going to be at Stanley Mosque. I just I just had a restraining order case, thank God, that I won just last week. So for it to be there, it will definitely capture a lot of um, eyes and ears. Yeah. That's Good. the main courthouse, 111 North organ- Hill. Yep, and guess who organized this demonstration? Who? Children, teenagers, no. the friends of Maya and Sebastian. They are organizing this demonstration. They want people to know what not only what happened to them, but the injustice about around these reunification camps. And these reunification camps are meant to quote deprogram children who claim child abuse. They see a psychologist who keeps them locked up in either a hotel for four days or in their home. And they are brainwashed and um, they need to recant their statement that they were abused. So on the one hand, when we, we're going to move into the next segment and talk about how do we prevent domestic violence and child abuse, one of the things we talk about is giving people, encouraging people to speak out, to speak the truth, to tell someone. But then when you do tell someone, if it ends up in family court, it will be used, it it can be used against you, which is very different from dependency court. And I'm wondering, Sharon, if you could (coughs) help us understand the difference between family court and dependency court. No, I'm going to be frank. I don't go to family court. I'm very happy I don't go to family court. The only time we go into Stanley Mosque are for the restraining order hearings. Um, I can't speak to dependency court, though. Okay. Dependency court is quite frightening. I've been to dependency court, and it's unlike criminal as well, where literally, I'll tell you about my last case. My last case was where a mother hired me, stating that her husband had been a husband of, I want to say, maybe about three years because the child that they have was about a year old. The husband had porn on his laptop at work, and somehow it was discovered. And when they found the porn on the laptop, they also got a warrant and came to the home. When they came to the home, they checked the home, there was a gun that was not in a locked safe where it could be. But remember, I told you this baby was one year old. Baby didn't you know, walk or anything and had no... No idea about the gun, No could have accessed the gun, could stand to get the gun, nothing. But here was my client as the mom, the person who was protecting the child. By the way, they live up in the mountains where there are bears. And uh, that was the reason for the gun. It wasn't like a regular gun that you think it was for a bear. And we were able to show that the mom had no idea, didn't have anything to do with the porn. So we completely Mm -hmm. moved that aside. And then as far as the gun and how it was kept, we were able to show due to them living in the hills and um, previous incidents of the bears coming through to you know where they lived, it, was, it really was in the best interest of the family. So my, my client won, we won, everything was fine. Now, that finished, we left uh, dependency court, everything is fine. However, obviously, I, I don't know what happened to the husband. Um, they were pursuing you know, criminal charges against him, 
But I advised her. I said, you want to keep your child? We got your child. You want to keep your child? She said, yes. I said, under no circumstances are you, you know, to allow him to come back into the home. So. And this was for porn, not child porn. I swear, just porn. Oh, no, no. I believe you. Yeah. Because I I don't know if you know, but I'm a sex addiction therapist. Yeah. And so I deal with sex addiction and porn addiction, and we don't usually see that. Oh, yeah. Typically, we see it with child porn. It, it was child porn. Oh, okay. Because there's it a was. difference between porn and child porn. No, I mean, it was child porn. Right. Okay. It that was makes per- or 15. The, okay. That girl. makes. And uh, the child was a girl, by the way. The one year old was a girl. Yeah. So that makes a huge difference because when we're dealing with child I porn. I know what happened to the guys in state prison where he belongs. I sure hope so. <laughs> I sure hope so. That's where he belongs. When he left, he was very calm and casual. Oh, there's nothing calm and casual about it. This As is taken was very calmly seriously. And locked up and yes. <laughs> taken to the back. All right, with that, we have to go to a quick commercial break. Our last one, everybody. So keep on staying tuned. You're listening to Call for Justice right here on 790 KABC. you into reoccurring automated text messages. Consent not required to purchase. Message and data rates may apply. Hey, Dan, how you doing? Haven't seen you around the gym. Yeah, I've really fallen off. Since I turned 40, I just don't get the results I used to get. Could be a lower testosterone. I went through it a while back. I got Nugenics Total T, and it's made a huge difference for me. I've seen that on TV. Is it for real? Oh, yeah. The patented key ingredient is something called Testafin, which helps boost free and total testosterone levels to help you trim up and stay lean. And it's made a difference for you? Man, I feel like I'm in my 20s again. At work, in the gym, and in the bedroom. Are they still giving out complimentary bottles for people to try it for themselves? Yeah, you just need to send them a text. Text BREAK to 321321 right now for your complimentary bottle of Nugenics Total Tea. Plus, text now and we'll include a bottle of Nugenics Thermo, our most powerful fat incinerator ever to help you get back into shape fast, absolutely free. Text B-R-E-A-K to 321321. That's BREAK to 321321. Products and statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease or illness. Ever wonder what the deal is with water filtration systems, what they combat, how they help? Tune in every Sunday at 10 a.m. to hear me, Randy, and my buddy Brad from Pro Water Solutions. He knows everything H2O. Sunday's at 10 a.m. right here on 790 KABC. AM 790 KABC. Okay, everybody, we're back for our final segment. This is criminal defense attorney Melissa Lefkowitz. And relationship and trauma recovery coach Dorit Reichenthal. And you're still listening to Call for Justice right here on KABC. And with us tonight is the fabulous and brilliant Sharon Gatton and Dr. Payam Kate. And we're discussing child abuse in the context of domestic violence. Dorit? So, I'm curious, what do you guys see from your perspective on prevention and treatment? So, unfortunately, Jerry, not everyone has access to all of the programs that you know about, least of all the court. Mm -hmm. The court always advises our clients, not really advises, they must do it, take a 52-week what's called DVC, domestic violence counseling classes. Right. That is it. Now... We might pepper in some NA classes, Narcotics Anonymous, let's say if there's a drug component, AA if there's an alcohol component, but that's really it. DVC classes, that's all they're offering Right. once a week for 52 weeks. What goes on there and what happens, frankly, the attorneys don't know. We just advise our clients to complete the classes so they don't violate probation. And so I can tell you they're mostly um, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, they're different behavioral Uh, modalities. And quite frankly, it's a drop in the bucket. Again, when you see the serious cases of domestic violence, you're talking about personality disordered people. And when there's a personality disordered person, most often, statistically, these are fixed character traits that really, you can improve on some of the behaviors, But there's no cure here. And so when there's increased stress, when there's, you know, drug abuse or 
any addiction or mental illness, you're going to see these behaviors escalate. Um, it requires trauma therapy. It requires a whole um, constellation of different treatments. And it's family treatments. I mean, it's not just for the abuser. You now need trauma therapy for all of those involved. There's got to be a lot more resources than a 52-week class. But there's always there's also the fact that they, you know, they do make you take ownership of the fact that it was done. I mean, not fully because you're allowed to plead no contest. (laughs) Right. But, you know, same same effect as a guilty plea, but it can't be used against you in a civil proceeding. Right. A no contest plea. So one other perk we should add. Those folks with the 273.5s, domestic violence. That's right. They cannot use, they cannot be in possession of a gun for 10 years. So there's that. I think that's a big thing. Right. That's a big thing. You know, but but there is that, there is that thing that they have to take responsibility. They've got to say, look, this is something that, you know, they're guilty of. And in a small percentage of cases, people can take ownership. Again, things are, this is all on a spectrum. But, you know, for these kinds of personality disordered people that you've taught me so much about doing mm-hmm. this show. Sure. Like narcissists and stuff. And anti, it's, it's not like even, it's the everywhere. antisocial. I feel Seriously? like it's huge for them to take responsibility. Like, I feel like that's like a big first step to have to say, look, I'm a deranged sociopath. Okay, wait. But no one's going to say that. Melissa, that's not that happening. Client, the client that I had that I told you with the 101 yards, Yeah, he pretended. Mm. No, of course. He literally got up there. Yes, I understand, Your Honor. Of course, I understand. And And that's when DCFS does not let you off the hook that easily. (laughs) Right. They don't. I mean, most of the time we don't because we know that they just say it so they can just get away with it and go away. That That everybody goes away. Really? Back to the same type of behavior. That's how they people don't change. These are the people that, beyond their mental illness, I should say, or personality disorders. They are extremely vulnerable and afraid. They want to maintain control in every possible way they can. They want to make sure they're intimidating and you are afraid of them. And they can gain control. And they want to, and that's part of the reason uh, when children get involved, DCFS get involved because they also teach their kids to hate the other parent too sometimes. I have seen it many, many times in 26 years I've been doing this. So this is, it's a, it, the, the hate does not naturally develop in a child. They're being thought. It's not a natural thing. A, a parent who actually teaches a child to hate sort of presents a, a grave level of danger to the child's mental health. That's why DCFS gets involved. It's not because we want to make sure you don't get beat up. Right. It's because we know what's going to happen to you when you grow up. You're going to grow up with a lot of depression, sadness, anxiety, a lot of other disorders that you develop throughout your life when you live with mental health issues issues that when you live with such people and you grow up in that kind of a home. So that and oftentimes and I'm sure you know a lot better than I can say this. A lot of times I have seen that the child actually identifies with the tormentor. And the reason they do that is because they want to avoid pain and conflict themselves in their own life. So they know that the best way to do it, I have to go towards the tormentor and abuse the victim myself. Oh my God. Yeah, yes, absolutely It's very right. true. It happens all the time. And that's why we get involved to prevent that. And and that's part of stock. That's part that's of That's what Stockholm I was going to say. Syndrome. The Stockholm syndrome. And yes. Very beyond well that, what makes them per- like this severe personality disorder is that they have little to no conscience Little to no empathy and little to no compassion, which is what makes these people, these parents, so dangerous. And yeah, for the child's own safety, they have to align with the abuse, oftentimes with the abusive parent, especially if there isn't someone who's going to intervene on behalf of the child and the protective parent. And I just want to add one more thing if there's time. Sure. If your case ends up in dependency court. Mm-hmm. And we file a case and we open a case. There are um, court appointment special advocates called CASA. Mm-hmm. They work CASA. with the child 
and that's it, those are beautiful people. They're very beautiful. beautiful. I have, I have a lot of friends them are actually that do that. attorneys. They're mm -hmm. actually attorneys. That you are can doing, volunteer at Casa. Can volunteer. Yes, you can. You can like, absolutely volunteer, volunteer right? at yes. Casa. They're that's looking cool. for volunteers. They are They're are always, always looking. looking. And I have friends that are the friends that I have that do it are like normal people. Normal people. You don't. You don't have to be a lawyer. You just have to be a little bright and understand the difference between abuse and no abuse. You got to know the difference. You have to answer people. a lot of questions. It's and a thorough take, application. And you can take classes 42 so you can get more education. And those advocates, I think, help a great deal because they literally work with the child and become their advocate. They even come to court and talk. It's important. To yeah. judge about the situation that wow. the child is in, which is not just DCFS. So because sometimes people say, oh, DCFS, they came up with their own plan. The CASA doesn't have a plan. There are volunteer people that come in and help the child. That's right. Beautiful. So interesting. That's something to do like later on. It's a in great life thing too. to do. I, think right. I love those people. So I, I respect them. Listen, a lot. before we run out of time, let's talk about how we can reach everybody. Yeah. Absolutely. Dorit, how do we reach you? You can reach me at Relationship Life Coaching 310 721 2119. Ooh, tell us again. Relationship Life Coaching 310-721-2119 and I specialize in couples, sexual addiction, and betrayal trauma. Amazing. And what about you, Sharon? I've learned so much tonight. Thank you. So anyone who needs anything related to um, criminal defense, if obviously you should go to Melissa first, second to me, <laughs> and uh, personal injury. I have two different departments. I don't want to tread on her. There, there's territory. just enough to go around. <laughs> there's no but, shortage of business here. Exactly. But criminal defense and personal injury, California Legal Counsel in our 21st year now, 21st wow. year. And uh, you can reach us at 888-704-9777. Again, 888- Seven zero four nine seven seven seven. Amazing. And Dr. Payam K. Uh, I have been in business since 2006. Um, I do child custody evaluations, child abuse uh, prevention and treatment. I do diversion, couples therapy, all sort of stuff. Anyway, wow. Um, Amazing. And you can always reach me at 310-709-1102. And what's the company called that we can look at? Uh, MindQuest Counseling. Perfect. All right. So you heard how to reach everybody. Here is how to reach me. My name is Melissa Lefkowitz. You can reach me at arrestsupport.com. My number is 213-DUI-TEAM. That's just the easy one. You can also reach me at 310-84-ARREST. You have been listening to Call for Justice. This has all been a call for justice tonight around child abuse and domestic violence but everybody please 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 go hashtag go call for justice justice for maya and sebastian everybody justice for maya and sebastian and while you're out there justice for masha amini justice for iran we are here calling for justice tonight you're listening to call for justice right here on KABC 790 AM. And we'll see you next week, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you, guys. You were Thank awesome. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. I don't even...